All right. Uh, my name is Matt Yedlin, and I've been associated with UBC Studios from 2016, though I met Saeed Dianat Carr back in 2012 when he came to record my classroom, and that motivated me to start working on the flip classroom. In 2017, I became the first faculty in residence at UBC Studios, working mainly on the light board, and developed, along with Saeed and Andrew, some new um, inventions, including the digital green screen. I've been working with Sam since 2016. Uh, we did a lot of recording 2017, and Sam was a work-learn student, and we really polished off a whole pile of videos in 2018. Yeah, um, since 2016, when I started my master's program, at the time, we never skipped any opportunity to, like, for me to TA for you when you teach Elector 11. That, that's how much we love this course. Um, so as Matt said, uh, I've also been on a work learn with Matt in 2018, had the opportunity to record 90, 90 videos uh, together for the flipped classroom, which we'll, we'll go into it uh, later on. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD student. Uh, researching quantum dot uh, technology and simulation. And my name is Andrew. I'm a media specialist here at UBC Studios and also started working with Matt on the light board back all the way in 2016. And I also worked with Sam quite a bit um, in 2018 when he also started to film light board videos along with Matt. And yeah, I've been, uh, I'm working as an operations um, and infrastructure specialist at UBC Studios, so cameras and all that fun stuff. Um, and super uh, glad to be able to be here with Matt and Sam today. All right. Um, so this is our agenda today. Um, so um, the things that we'll be going over. And in the beginning, we'll just give a pretty brief history and timeline look of the light board at UBC and kind of how it started here. And then um, yeah, we'll start looking at the transition and pivot of 2020. I'll cover more of the technical things, and Sam will actually follow up with some uh, notes on the pivot. Yeah, um, well, the, the ELEC uh, kind of flipped classroom collaboration started even before 2020, so we'll do an overview from the earlier work of recording the videos, how we prepared for a flipped classroom, all the way to how this was adapted to COVID, and even post-COVID, if you can call it that. Uh, where students start coming back to school? Well, I'm really fortunate because I started the flipped classroom in 2012 when I noticed the students were horribly distracted in class and looking at their phones all the time. And what I wanted to say was, this is a team effort. Here, are the, We're all the, in this together, the three of us, Sam, myself, and Andrew. And no one person is bigger than the team. We've all contributed our various uh, amounts of expertise. So one of the things we really want to get across here today is that teamwork, studios, my department, Sam is part of the department. We're all in this together. And this organic contribution really created the learning communities that we're talking about today. And as a result of the previous work from 2016 to 2019, there was nothing we had to do when COVID came and we could focus on aspects of delivery rather than content. I will look at uh, the case study with all of us contributing later on in the program and then we will summarize what to do in the future and lessons learned. All right, so let's uh, jump right into looking at the history of the light board at UBC. Um, so I have a little timeline here. And then here we're going to start in pre-2014, actually 2014 to start. So the light board technology itself was actually first brought to UBC through our good friends here at CTLT and featured in Celebrate Learning Week back in 2014. And there is, um, um, so that's kind of when it first started. And I think it lived in the bottom floor of the RSC basement there. Um, and then we move a little bit forward to 2016. And that's when we kind of moved that set up over here to UBC Studios. And um, as we started offering a couple of DIY initiatives, including the light board, the one button studio, and the DIY audio recording suite uh, around then. Um, and then we can uh, move on to between 2016 and 2018. And, um, 
we did a lot of testing together, then we met. On the yeah, it was really great. And yeah. in 2017, I spent the first, the second part of my sabbatical at UBC Studios as faculty in residence. And in that time, uh, we worked on the digital green screen and enabled us to do things that you'll see shortly. So we're going to present three examples. And you can see a still from the first example. It's a video of a rotating vector and talks about sines and cosines. The second video is uh, my presentation at Google. And the third video is about social learning using the light board. So we'll just start. I'm going to keep quiet uh, mm -hmm. after the videos are over. We can have a pause for questions and comments before we continue. So all quiet on the set. Go ahead, Andrew. All right. Welcome to sine and cosine function. This is our first pilot test of interacting with a video using Beamer. And so what you can see is a rotating phaser rotating around there it hits Minus 90, it's going to hit zero. We'll let it spin around a couple more times and we'll show how we interact with this video and we'll pause it and talk about it. And we'll do that the minute the uh, things, the vector arrow swings around to about 135 degrees. So right about now. Well, just past 135. So there's my arrow right there and I've got to use the right color of pen to do that. So here we are, there's the arrow, and right here you can see that the orange is the cosine, and this color here, the light, it's actually a light blue, represents the sine, the projection of this vector onto the x-axis and onto the y-axis gives us sine and cosine, and you can see the numbers in the bottom right. And this really is a great way of interacting with the video, and I can say boo to you right behind it. Thanks a lot for watching. From quarries to nuclear weapons tests, we see a picture of a quarry in southern Jordan, and we see a picture of a nuclear weapons test. At UBC, in collaboration with Google and six international researchers, we are working to study source signatures to better understand the difference between those from quarry blasts and nuclear blasts. Here's an example. You see three component recordings from one earthquake on the top and below a quarry blast. And what's interesting is the difference between the P wave arrival time compression and S shear wave arrival time. But those have errors. And in fact, it's very hard to pick the P wave arrival. And there's also channel errors in the seismic velocities which cause mislocations. This video created by Tyler Erickson shows deformation over some 25 years at the surface of the Jordanian quarry. I've taken two images recorded by Sentinel-2 in the time period from May to June of this year, and we're going to see if we can notice any deformation difference between them. We've applied an edge detector to each of the two images. So if there was a crater or blast that occurred between the two images, hopefully we might see the result when we subtract the edges detected. We have taken the difference of the edges detected for each of the Sentinel recordings. Substantively, all we see is speckle noise and the remnants of roads. What does the future hold? First of all, we need more data, data that we can get from the seismic investigators in Ireland. We need to do more processing with Google Earth Engine and pursue its maximum capability. We also need to get help in ground truthing the quarry blasts in Jordan. Further, we need to get stronger connection with the CTBTO and get them involved in using Earth Engine for their goal of nuclear non-proliferation, and we need you. <gasps> you totally just Why ran into me! Stop! Oh my god! I'm in a hurry! You totally hurt me! I have to get going! Oh, my 
The light, the light was yellow. yellow. The light was yellow. We don't stop at yellow. It's totally your fault. You should have been more careful. The light is yellow. We stop at red. No, I'm in a hurry. Yellow means I am in a stop. hurry. If it's not safe, it wasn't safe. I stop. You should. We're going. More we time. were barely crawling along at like less than 50 kilometers an hour. You could have gone a bit you, faster. You should have been going a lot slower. You've totally just wrecked my day. You're so selfish. I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, this is me, wasting please. my time. Officer, she Ladies? totally just ran into me. What happened? So I'll talk. Uh, before we continue, we'll pause. If anybody has any questions, you can, <coughs> excuse me, put them on the chat. Or you can also talk to us directly, I think. A, yeah, yep. there's not that many people. As Homer Simpson said, we're very unformal. Huh? <laughs> okay. All right. No questions? No chat questions? Good, there'll be a test after at the end <laughs> on the three videos. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, continue on. So um, now we're moving to around 2018. And um, for us here at UBC Studios, is that well, we had the opportunity to do the first, I guess, Lightboard live stream course um, back in 2018 as well as 2019 with Dr. Mark McLean from the math department. And this is the first of its kind. We had a lot of um, partners that were helping us with um, AV. And during that time, live stream classroom wasn't as common as uh, like currently um, back, back then. But Mark, uh, Dr. McLean did that during the time because there actually wasn't enough classrooms for his course during that time. And that's when he decided to do it um, via a Lightboard live stream. And the feedback and, uh, that he got from the students was really positive. And um, the students really enjoyed it, especially going back and being able to see and um, review the formulas that he put out. Because one of the things in math course is a lot of the times they're trying to write down the formulas and then they're raising the board. So having that option and being able to see it on the light board was a big positive for him. And in that time frame, uh, that's also when we were filming a lot of videos. Um, we were meeting up, what, two, twice, three times a week, coming to studios, uh, recording the 90 videos for ELEC 311. Um, so in, in that time, we were also preparing our online course. So it's, it's not just about having the videos and having them available to watch, right? There's also Q&A to kind of probe the students to think right after the videos. Uh, there are weekly assessments and stuff. So all those need to be programmed into and arranged into a learning management system. So in that time frame, we were also doing all that in 2018 and kind of putting them into practice in class since then. And you also, Sam, what you did was you actually moved from our implementation mm. in edX to uh, pilot for Canvas. you like to right. comment on yeah, that? Yeah, because uh, previously Matt's uh, flip classroom was offered on uh, Attic, so all the materials were laid out on Attic, but uh, UBC was transitioning to Canvas, and at the time we also did kind of a pilot uh, on how to transition this course and how to best lay out a course on Canvas because the tooling is different um, and the, the resources available on that platform is different. So we just want to make the best use out of Canvas at the time too. So in 2019, when we taught in the fall, we were all ready to go for COVID even the conversion from edX to Canvas. So that was really amazing. There was nothing we had to do when COVID came in so far as content was concerned. Right, right. And what we also learned was that humor is very important in delivery. We'll see a few examples of that later. <laughs> um, all well, right. Only a few. I thought we'd take about an hour to have some stand up. Mm, okay, <laughs> we'll see about that. All right. And all right, so moving to 2020, as everyone knows, uh, this is when the COVID 19 pandemic really hit and class transitioned to mostly an online learning model during this time. And we also updated all our DIY studios here at UBC Studios, including the light board, to. Um, to make it so that it has live stream capabilities and it uses it use a different system so more easy to operate system than the one we previously used with Dr. McLean 
and also added integrations with Zoom, Teams, and what we were still using, Blackboard Collaborate, and um, as well as some of the layout uh, changes that we did. Then 2021. So coming to 2021, what we had already in place was we had our flipped classroom in place, all in Canvas already, having done the conversion from the flipped classroom to Canvas in 2020. And um, we saw that there's, there's some advantages in remote as opposed to flip. Sam, Actually, would you yeah. like to comment on that? Um, so remote, let, let's recap what happened in remote even. So mm -hmm. it's still a flipped classroom. Um, so students still watch videos at home at their leisure that we've uploaded beforehand and do questions that we've assigned them online. Uh, what changed in our context is the lectures or the, the in-class sessions are not in person. They are remote uh, through Zoom. So on Zoom, we have a few tools available. Uh, Matt or TA would screen share and, and, and do the, the, the problems with the students. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a huge advantage and a huge difference is students now have a chat box to use, to type on the side um, for, for us to view, right? And Matt could continue teaching. Uh, TAs uh, like myself and the other TAs could reply to students without interrupting the class. Um, and Matt, do you have any other comments about that? Well, one of the things that Sam mentioned regarding chat was the students actually would take over the class. They would start helping each other in the chat. Mm -hmm. And so the problem sessions that we did face to face evolved to the students tutorialing each other during that work period. And so half of our classes in pure remote became tutorial festivals. It was really amazing. You'd never ever see that spontaneously developing in a face-to-face -face setting. So with all that in place, we were perfectly set up for combining the two to create the hybrid situation in 2021. All right, and then when Matt came to us and he's like, hey, we're going to start doing a hybrid model, I was like, okay, what can we do with the Lightboard setup that can help facilitate this and make this as smooth as possible? Um, so we basically what we did is we added additional monitors that you'll see later, one that you can see the Zoom chat as well as the individual student windows. It's over here on my left, I think. Um, so we have one over there. And then we also have our original confidence monitor where you can see kind of what's going on on the stream on our right. Um, we also moved the operator station to a different room so that um, there's uh, co more COVID friendly. And lastly, we swapped hardware and software to make it um, easier to run the, the live stream classrooms. And as you saw earlier, we had these like nice smooth transitions from the PowerPoint to basically this uh, smaller window. So that's kind of part of the software that we're using. And it just gives that gives the classroom a bit more um, polish, I guess you can call it, um, for for the live stream class. And yeah. So we're now moving into the case study. A look at Elect three eleven. All right. All right so I'm just you want to go operate in the back? <laughs> are you going to advance Andy. those three uh, slides? Uh, yeah. Okay. So Andrew was often going to work, worked out of the um, operator room behind us, the old sound studio, uh, where he's here for most of the time. But he's gone back now to uh, manipulate the slides and, and monitor. OK, so uh, Andrew, could you advance to the next slide, please? You want to do it here? Oh, uh, we can do it, yeah. Oh, uh, we can do it here, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that? I will just do it here. So here the, here's the background to the, the course. We take a little bit of snapshots. We're going to do it in a little more detail here. So we started with our development of our videos, of which there are 90. And we have a bit of uh, snaps to show you from these. 
Uh, there's a slide that I'm wearing a little mask and scaring Sam. <laughs> Bit of humor there. Um, next one. We are going to the beach. It's real hot. Why are we going to the beach? Well, we're going to the beach to study waves because this class is all about waves. And uh, this is my favorite snap from the whole 90 videos. Uh, you can see that Sam is coming on the right there carrying a garbage can and I'm kind of looking at him as if he went from the moon. I was finishing up this stuff and Sam went off camera and he didn't tell me. And then he came back holding this garbage can. And I asked him, I asked you, what are you doing, Sam? And what did you say? You said we were going to the beach, so I was packing up. Yeah, so I <laughs> completely uh, from the moon. Uh, Sam comes uh, from an acting background, so it's great to have him here. Um, to spice things up and uh, move from nerdy people like myself. Well, that's an exaggeration, but I'll take that. <laughs> okay, well, so we, we had all this in place in terms of the, uh, the flipped version of the course. You've heard about it already. And we were all set in 2019. Sam, would you like to comment on our fully remote development in uh, 2020? Yeah, so in 2020, once again, we transitioned the class uh, completely to Canvas, uh, and students participate remotely uh, on Zoom weekly. I think there are some important points uh, there in, in, in that remote environment. We were really concerned that the students feel the, uh, a lack of kind of connection between students and between student and prof. So having the videos we've heard <clears throat> actually help a lot in this connection between student and prof because they feel just by me interacting with Matt uh, on the videos, they, they feel a personal connection through the videos as if we were there teaching them. Uh, so, so that's a huge advantage. We also opened up uh, Piazza so students could ask any questions they want about the course uh, or, or rent if they want, we, we let them do that. Um, and, and, and basically get responses pretty quickly, either from us or from other students. So that's kind of self-propelling learning community. We decided not to use Proctorio even before UBC kind of stopped uh, having it available because we thought using an honor, or rather Proctorio itself felt pretty invasive. Their whole monitor is, moni is the, the, the whole screen is monitored, camera is monitored. We feel that they're not criminals or anything that we need to monitor, we could do it on an honor system uh, and, and design the tests uh, accordingly so it's not too simple in that setting. Um, is there anything I'm missing? No, I think that's good. The, the point was um, that we decided, Sam and I decided after probably 20 hours of discussion, right? It was Quite a lot, a lot. of discussion yeah, we, we talked about, it a lot. about proctoring and what we did was we established the idea of the learning community early on because we did a welcome video and that was suggested to us by Jason Myers. It was a really great success. That video is still there. And then we established the learning community idea right from the get go. So they had to do a waiver saying on their exam as part of this learning community we are going to stick by the rules that have been given us for the exam. So we're not really, they weren't really disadvantaging anyone else. And it, it actually worked pretty well. Um, and we didn't see any big bulk shifts in grades indicating any kind of mass cheating or any kind of cheating uh, that would exceed what you would normally have in a face-to-face -face setting. Now, with all that in place, we were ready to move to hybrid. And what was interesting about the remote case was students were more willing to be asking questions in the chat. They weren't as inhibited. And there is a psychological uh, term for this. It's called the disinhibition uh, on, on remote connections. So that can be done for pranks that can be going not a little bit sideways, but we can take advantage of the disinhibition 
and get students more engaged. Now, when we went to um, hybrid mode, and by the way, this was after the uh, going back face to face in February, we got permission to do half the class in live stream and half face to face. And that was kind of a pilot in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering directed by Steve Wilton, who supported us in getting the live stream portion going. Now, what happened was during live stream, the students would engage on the chat. So we were curious to know what would happen once we returned to face to face. So at least in, at the very beginning, what we saw was that the students would carry over their desire to ask questions that they did in remote, but now they were feeling less inhibited to ask the questions in face to face. And it was just amazing. The students really got involved and they asked us uh, numerous times. They asked me and, and Sam and I have talked about this and we will be pursuing it to write a textbook. They're really, really engaged. Okay, so now we want to present a mini version of the class. Who can wait? A live demo. So, this is our live oh, demo. I, I think um, there, there was a question. Oh, how did the class get divided in, out of? Uh, I don't understand the question. Can you do that orally, yeah. please? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, uh, I was just wondering if the students like self-selected, like I would prefer to attend in live stream or I would prefer to attend in person or if they were assigned that way from their sections. No, there's just one section in the course in that term. Mm -hmm. And so the whole class, we, we set it up in advance and it was actually part of a pilot program for the department because the previous lecture just before mine, also in electrical engineering, had, had been delivered online. And the two of us, uh, was Dr. Nick Yeager and myself, we had the classes back to back. So it worked out really well to go from in uh, remote in his setting. It wasn't live stream like from the studio, traditional remote, and then coming to our class Tuesday was live stream and Thursday was face to face. So uh, it, was it was the same group selection. of students. Got it. It was the same group of students. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so here is our little demo. How hot is a hot pepper? So I'll begin with a little discussion. And by the way, this is done. I use this, uh, this is courtesy of Jim Sibley from the Center for Instructional Support in the Faculty of Applied Science. How hot is a hot pepper? How hot? Yeah, I'm getting hot already just thinking <laughs> about it. Uh, look at the picture, there's on the left is Wilbur Lincoln Scoville, you heard of him? You heard of him? Now I have. Now you have. He worked for the famous uh, company, drug company called Park Davis. And he developed a scale of hotness. How did he do the scale? It was a qualitative, quantitative scale. So we took different peppers, like not too hot, very hot. We'll see the units in a minute and he had a testing panel and he gave the testing panel dried pepper so, uh, dissolved in alcohol with some sugar. And so the idea was they would taste this and see if there was burning of the tongue. Then he would give them a 50% dilution and then the hotter the pepper, the more dilutions would be required so they wouldn't feel any burning anymore. And so that was the qualitative quantitative scale. So it was a kind of an exponential scale, but also had the qualitative part 
that said, oh, it's too hot or I just don't feel the heat anymore. So very smart idea. So you say, well, wait a minute, we've got, and you see the calipers there, liquid chromatography to do it. Well, liquid chromatography can give you very accurate answers, but it's totally missing the qualitative part. Now, in the third slide, and we have a pepper here, you'll see it in a minute. Uh, you can see that arrow points to the membrane, inner membrane is where the active oil ingredient, which is called capsaicin, sits. And capsaicin is soluble in alcohol and fat. So now let's go forward and look at the scale. So, uh, a bell pepper has a hotness scale of zero. Not a surprise there. The hottest uh, scale is habaneros, 550,000 heat units. Little old jalapeno isn't hot at all, it's only 4,500. A good shot of cayenne pepper is 35,000. It's kind of in the middle, but if you know cayenne, you don't want to exactly have buckets of it on your uh, curry. Mm -hmm. So let's see. How hot is the hot pepper? So we got the scale. Now, real life. Okay, Sam is going to look at the test here. Uh, maybe Andrew could move the slide a bit. Andrew, can you move? Uh, yeah, there, awesome. there we go. Uh, okay, what have we got here? Sam has got a, a pepper, uh, a bell pepper. Got a pepper here? Yeah. It's a real pepper, it's not a prop. Yeah, you're going to actually eat some of it in a minute. Are you, are, are you going to list the, the question first? The, the questions are there. We're, we're going to uh, set it all up, and then, Andrew, you can do the poll. So the way it'll work is that students, you participants, will answer the poll. And then uh, while you're answering the poll, you can open the chat. So we'll just get ready here for a minute. So there, he's cut the... Uh, the pepper, one of the, the pepper samples, and uh, we need some of this. We'll need some of this. Where's our cup for our Brandy Alexander? That's fine. Uh, okay. Okay, here goes. Okay, oh wait. Um, what are you eating? Uh, bell pepper. <laughs> bell pepper. <clears throat> bell pepper. Hot scale was zero. Uh, look, let's be scientific and try it out first. Yeah, so we'll have an eating break. How is it? Yeah, man, something's wrong with this pepper. What's wrong with it? <laughs> it's not spicy at all. Actually, according to the previous slide, it's not wrong. Ah. Oh. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> So, how are we going to fix this, Matt? <laughs> we have a habanero pepper. Well, we did not have a <laughs> habanero pepper, but let's uh, see what we got here. Um, was that spicy enough, Sam, the bell pepper? And a spice, if, if you count zero as spicy enough, then sure. Well, I think that's no good. So we'll have habanero, uh, not habanero, but cayenne. Mmm, spicy. So here's cayenne. Whew. So here's my spoon. And I'll give them a lot. Oh my, no, man. There, there's my lot. It's pretty small. It's like, uh, we'll take a bit out. Okay. Do you want to just dip that in the... Let's do it. Just put it on the... Since that's zero, we can use that. Okay, here we go. Okay, Set. there goes Let's, nothing. And I'm supposed to chew for one minute? You better pull the drinks quick, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, <coughs> this is our alcohol for the mm. Brandy Alexander. Whoa, this one works. 
So that's a uh, brandy. Well, Matt, you didn't go easy on me. Oh. And uh, here's the whipping cream. Oh, geez. We need whipping cream oh. for Brandy Alexander. And uh, what else have we got here? Water. Oh, water. Maybe you need a sip of water. <laughs> well, we won't <laughs> drink the beer, but here it is. All right. And there's a yogurt. Just... So can everybody see the question so we have and the all answer? Four uh, <clears throat> Andrew, do you want to put up the poll? Oh, I'll go. Nope. Okay, poll time. Go easy on the alcohol, <laughs> yeah. So it's not worrying. It's like a float rather than an Alexander, but pretend that this is brandy. So we have four choices for Sam. I don't know where the poll is here. Oh, okay, so I can see the results of the poll. Where are they? Oh. Vanilla yogurt with... Oh, vanilla yogurt got 40, 80%. Frozen brandy got zero. Glass of pale ale got 20%. And two glasses of cold bottled mineral water got zero. Now, I think my minute is up. Yeah, so do you want to have some brandy, Alexander? I mean, it's root beer, not brandy. We can't have drinking without a liquor license in studios. So it's more like a root beer float. Yum. Yeah, that was good, huh? It's good. So uh, in the chat, so this, this is interesting. So what would happen now is in the chat, you can see that people had fun. Go easy on the alcohol, don't worry. That, that, how is that root beer? It's not real beer. Uh, do you want to comment on why you picked what you did? So this would be the student interaction. And then we'll take you behind the scenes when we're done. But right now, we're really curious about why you thought, uh, why you picked what you did. So uh, orally, please, or in the chat, just see what's happening. So this is what happened in class. I chose the one I thought would have the most fat to tame the heat. So what did you pick, Ainsley? Did you, you picked uh, the yogurt? Yogurt. I picked yogurt for the same oh. reason, Ainsley. You and I are on the same table. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? Uh, the other choice was pale ale. Pale ale. Also got a high rating. So why did you pick pale ale? Why did you pick pale ale? I didn't pick it. But I'm, <laughs> I didn't pick it, but I'm guessing that it's because you mentioned earlier that alcohol can help with the heat. Right. So Water doesn't work. So water and capsaicin is an oil in an oil. So water and oil don't mix. Don't drink water. That's bad. Don't drink beer because beer has a lot of water in it. <laughs> so it's C and D, uh, vanilla yogurt, which has the fat, but Brandy Alexander has fat and alcohol so the answer is brandy alexander so Yay. when you're when you're going out to a mexican restaurant and you know it's really hot order something that has fat and alcohol as a drink there you go lesson learned okay so now we're gonna go behind the scenes uh what i have here is i have uh, we have three things going on, is that you can see a slide, you can see a chat, and if I was doing equations about this, I could draw and you'd see the equations, and you can see that this is what you see in the behind the scenes slides. So I'm behind the light board, confidence monitors over there, and when I'm writing, so I'm going to write 
right here. And it, you can't really see it, but this dot is actually appearing there on the confidence monitor. Now, the great thing about this was that if I'm presenting and I can see the chat over there on the confidence monitor, then I can pivot if there's a question, I can deviate directly from my presentation to the student's question without dropping anything. It's seamlessly integrated, whatever I have to do. Yes, that's correct. So that seamless pivot from presentation to answering student questions facilitated by the confidence monitor, again, that has the chat, it has the president presenter, has the ability to write, and it has here, you can't see it, but it has the, um, the window of, for the presentation material. So the integration of the light board with Zoom in this fashion allows you to do things you cannot do face to face. If you have to answer a student's question, you have to turn around and write on the board, or you have to go down and write on your tablet. You, you don't keep eye contact when you're doing that answer. Whereas here, seamless contact is maintained. Fantastic tool embedded in the light board. So you can see what we have is basically live stream inside of a live stream. And that's all. So a pause here for any questions. And do you want to pass me a towel? I'll erase this, these things. Any questions about that, what we've discussed so far? Matt, perhaps you can um, write the letter A, B, C, D, E just to show people how the letter got flipped around. Oh yeah, okay, so I'll just do. Yes. So you see it A, B, C, D, but everyone, I get lots of stuff online saying, well, you had to write it backwards because the camera's on the other side, but studios did something very inventive. They put a 45 degree mirror just in front of the camera feed, which flips everything around. Well, Andrew, yeah. perhaps you can show people the behind the scene A, B, C, D. Oh. Andrew, can we do that? Just like what you did uh, we don't earlier. Have a behind the scene, we don't have a feed that has the, uh, the flipped. Yeah, ABC. here, here, here. Yeah, but you'd have to see it from the other side. Well, yeah, so, ABC. Then, so, then, so on the other side of the glass, it would be the opposite. Oh, yeah, Andrew's going to do it. That's what you'd see. Yes. Thank you. So I, we have a story to tell about that. And that is that we had the students use the light board in the class, ELEC 311, which is the class on waves, and we had them use the light board to explain how the light board works. And one of the smart students put a, took the word reflection and had t-shirts printed, but he printed reflection backwards so that when it was photographed with the camera, it would appear forwards. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty clever. So we are warned not to wear writing because it'll then get flipped. But if the writing is flipped, it comes out in the right order. Yeah, that student is prepared. Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, I think that. Okay, so uh, how are we doing here? We're on to the uh, lessons learned. Just make sure we got all these lessons here. There were a lot of lessons learned. Yeah. And Sam, what, what do we have to say about lessons learned? What are I mean, I, I think one major point we hit on was the simultaneous chat discussion. Um, because in class, uh, students really participated more through the chat. And as, as Matt said, kind of even brought that forward to in person because they're, they're more familiarized uh, with us. They're more familiar with the setting of the classroom and how to ask questions effectively with us, I feel. Um, and also the fact that 
you as an instructor uh, could pivot between instructing and reading the chat. Right? Am I missing anything? No, I think, I think those are all good lessons learned. The thing that I've been concerned about with the light board is the issue of scale. Like, I'm one professor. We should have more facilities. It's not a lot of money to uh, buy one of these. You can buy them commercially, about $10,000. And we, you can see the advantages of using the light board plus the technology developed here in studios. Uh, we need to buy what's called a switcher. It was about two to three thousand more dollars. And then you're all set. You can do the digital green screen and all those things and overlays like you're seeing here in the presentation. But it really takes us to the future. What are we going to do in the future? And uh, I'll just advance, but this is the last slide. So, in the future, um, incorporation of remote learning. Do you want to talk about that, uh, Sam? Yeah, some important points here that I can't miss here now. Um, so, really, we've, we've learned a lot, I think, from the past few years of experience and try to really take the best of each setting right and apply it to future changing settings um, so i think what we one of the points we learned was um, th all these uh, remote and in-person mix of technologies we can use them to build tighter communities uh, for example uh, uh, the, the 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 seamlessness of the chat um, using Piazza to ask questions anytime. Uh, we think that help a lot with tightening the community. Um, they also en encourage student en uh, engagement as we've kind of gone through time and time again. Um, and there are some environmental pros as well. Uh, like for this hybrid setup we did in the past term, if the student uh, was, was learning, as in the, if the student was not on campus to begin with, then it cuts their commuting by half because they need to only need to come in class half the time. Now, if they decide to watch the recordings of the in-person classes, which were recorded, then it cuts it down even more. Um, so it gives them the flexibility. Uh, and also it releases classroom space when we're not using it. If, if we really go full on in hybrid and not need a classroom dedicated to the remote sessions, then those rooms might, might be converted to some other use like dry labs, or other purposes at a university, which is very valuable. Yeah, just following up on what Sam said, converting classroom space to dry labs really allows for embedding companies and research facilities right in departments. And that's the way it's done in places like MIT. So we're competing on the, not on the global scale with places like MIT. That means looking to the future the university has to invest in proper infrastructure. Uh, whereas we did part of our uh, live stream out of the studios, I had another class that was done with Zoom in the classroom and live, and there are all kinds of issues with the internet. We actually had to sign on as UBC visitor. So if we want to move forward, we need to invest so we have more facilities, and the facilities that we have operate reliably. In terms of other faculty using this, they also need help in converting some of their PowerPoint decks to this kind of format, because they're very busy, a lot of them with their research groups, so they don't have the time, so we have to facilitate that. So investment in facilities, investment, in uh, aids to converting class. And then the whole thing boils down to this creates a platform from which we can extend UBC out there in a global setting so we can improve the experience of globally registered students who are remote. And that improves the experience of online offerings. And uh, we can go forward by looking at not only micro masters, but I suggest, and we're starting to do that, micro bachelors. So two year courses where there's a lot of uh, learning in a practical setting. And all this is facilitated by the light board. 
So we would like, as our team here, to thank you for <laughs> being here and look forward to seeing you in the future. Uh, there's a question in the chat. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's good. Oh, about that. Oh, thank you, Jocelyn. Um, there is a thank you, Bree. Can I ask a question? I'm asking question to ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so when you talk about when you have half this class in person and half of the class on joining on live stream. Uh, just a minute, I have to say something. I didn't maybe say it correctly. Half the class time. Okay. So it's all the students yes. are coming to class one day and live stream the other day. Okay. So it's the same group of students. They're yes. either in the class face to face or the second day they're live stream. So during the face to face day, you will also be meeting the students in person in the classroom. Well, that's what face to face yes. is. It's yes. live yes. presentation to the students. So if you like conventional setting, however, we chose to record that face to face because we didn't want to disadvantage students who were sick. And believe me, there are right. always three to five people in the class who had COVID and so on who are sick. So you can't just then pivot for those three to five students. The extra workload would be enormous. So we thought for everybody's benefit, we'll just continue recording the face to face. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you for uh, that, Ainsley. Uh, we'll look forward to getting feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the connection to UBC Studios. Uh, I'm on the electrical engineering website, so you can get me there. And if you want to talk to Sam, just I'll, I can forward stuff to him. Um, and uh, fantastic, actually. By the way, uh, to move things forward, we're planning to present this to the Professional Engineering Association next fall. This, this demonstration, mm -hmm. uh, this talk, and you're going to adjust it a little bit, but uh, basically similar talk. I think it'll be a hit. And I think that Sam, I think that you got to be harder on Sam next time, though. You know, with <laughs> well, hotter peppers, hotter peppers. Something to chew on that's really good. <laughs> well, I can get a habanero pepper. I was secretly kind of enjoying huh? it. It's actually kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, except that I, uh, So that reminds me of a personal story where I was invited out to dinner by the editor in chief of the Gage Book Company back in the 1970s. And we were sitting there, and the waitress came by and she said, Is there anything else I can get you? And this was an Indian restaurant, or spicy food. And I turned to her and I said, Yes. She said, What is it? I said, A fire extinguisher. And we end <laughs> off with that. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> All right. Okay.